Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our sixth um, TMA HI uh, History Behind. And I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're very fortunate that Josh Levine has uh, agreed to be our speaker for tonight, and we're going to be looking back over three of his books. But to begin with, we'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, Pupil Progress, Welby, and Teachers Love Stationery. Our trackers encompass our trackers every history, encompass qualification, every history qualification and exam board, calculating grades exactly, grades exactly as the As data is entered, an instant grade is created for each student. Furthermore, as scores are inputted into our trackers, the teacher receives instant question level analysis alongside a RAG rating to show whether the student is above, below or on target. Our trackers are so useful now because you are able to identify the gaps in students' learning. Once these gaps have been identified, you can create end-of-topic tests that link directly to each historical assessment outcome. These can then be uploaded onto your trackers. Once completed, these will clearly demonstrate the progress students have made, thereby closing learning gaps. This data that has been added allows for instant downloadable reporting. Our reports identify the current grade, average unit grade and breakdown of each individual historical paper. They also demonstrate the percentage of marks achieved for each historical outcome. The reports clarify next steps for students and enable effective dialogue with their teacher about improving in history. As students return to classroom learning, it is likely that a mock series will run. Our software enables you to build in entire papers into your tracker. Once Wellbe is a systemized solution which helps improve staff well-being and build it into your school culture. You can see where you are now and plan where you want to be. Using the evidence-based survey, the Health and Safety Executives Indicator tool, you can see your staff members' scores in your online dashboard. This shares a full report including analysis, benchmarks and heat maps. Use our suggested priority actions, which means it's much easier and faster to take positive steps. Staff also share their comments, providing further insight into actions needed and you're able to respond to them anonymously, creating greater engagement. Wellbe allows you to easily share your results with staff and governors using a PowerPoint presentation which you can easily download. You can book a results review call with a wellbeing expert and let us help you set the right goals and actions to achieve the outcomes you need. With Wellbe Voice you can follow up on post-survey actions and track progress over the next 12 months. You can also use it for anything else where staff anonymity will help, for example with consultations or following a change. Send staff members a message, ask a question or seek feedback. It's as easy as sending an email. The one difference being it is an anonymous conversation. You can invite all staff to take part or groups as little as eight. This means that you only need to invite relevant staff such as those affected by the changes you've made. This might be teachers, support staff, middle leaders, teaching assistants or any group of staff in your school. You choose the titles you use. Hi, my name is Sabrina and I'm the co-owner and founder at Teachers Love Stationery Club and we're really pleased to be sponsoring this Teach Me Icons history event. We provide monthly, bi-monthly or quarterly boxes filled with stationery we know you'll love for $12.49 a box, all designed and made for teachers by teachers. I have one of our past boxes here to show you. The theme changes every month and May's box of sweet treats. Um, as you can see here, the box is A4 sized and about 2 centimeters thick. So it'll fit through a standard size post box. Some of the goodies that month included are a uh, macaron sticky notes, 
macaron washi tape and a macaron themed notebook. There was also a um, pack of four Faber-Castell branded highlighters, some raceable pens, a variety of reward stickers that you use in the classroom with your pupils, and a little treat for you, a pack of two little biscuits. If you're interested in subscribing to our boxes, go to www.teacherslovestationery.club and use the code HUMSICONS at checkout to get £2 off your first box of stationery. We'll also include some history subject specific reward stickers and your first box um, includes a personal pencil case. And this time we're for you guys at Teach Me Icons History. We're going to have this little uh, lovely glittery image of a suffragette on your personalised pencil cases. Thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of your event. And thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Josh for joining us tonight. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, to Josh's extensive uh, number of books, I have to say. Um, in um, in our, this is the, the second time that Josh has actually joined the TM History Icon. Um, event. It was back on the 17th of March 2018 in Chester, where uh, Josh actually delivered a presentation on Dunkirk after being part of the um, historical advisor to the motion picture. He's a writer, broadcaster, historian, actor and barrister. Um, and uh, he's a best-selling author um, who has several books, including Dunkirk, the history behind the motion picture. Uh, which spent five weeks at the top of the Sunday Times bestsellers list, The Secret History of the Blitz, Forgotten Voices of the Somme, Blitz and Battle of Britain, and Beauty and Atrocity, his first debut bill, book, Into the History of the Irish Troubles, which was shortlisted for the Writers Guild Nonfiction Book of the Year Award. Josh, you're very welcome to join us tonight, and thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much for having me, Andy. It's, it's really, it's lovely to be here. I mean, I'm here, but you know what I mean. Lovely to be talking to you. Absolutely do. And um, first of all, we've, um, we're have we going to be looking at over three books mm -hmm. um, that you've made. Your first book um, uh, is uh, Beauty and Atrocity on the Irish Troubles. And um, why, first of all, I wanted to ask you a question. Why did you choose these three books in particular? Uh, well, the two, uh, Beauty and Atrocity on the Troubles and The Secret History of the Blitz are my two favourite books. They're the two books that I... Uh, I think are my, uh, personally, I think are my best books. I chose them because it was, it was such an unusual, the whole event around it. The fact that I was, you know, I'd done a, an, I'd already done an oral history on um, Dunkirk, or I'd edited an oral history on Dunkirk, which had been kind of the thing that inspired the, um, the director to, to, to want to make the film, or certainly one of the things that inspired him. and. Uh, and then I worked as on the film as a historical advisor and then did the book of the film and the history of the film, history of the, the real event. So that and th so that was such an, uh, an extraordinary opportunity, such a strange event. And, you know, so so that one stands alone. But so far as books are concerned, the, one, the ones I really enjoyed with the other two that, that, that I've, I've got here tonight. Right, tonight. And just interesting, uh, being um, your previous experience as an actor and a barrister, has that yeah. helped in writing the three histories it has it has because i mean i started off as a as a barrister i was a criminal uh barrister uh working in, in defense and uh yeah i mean i i um i did that for for a while did you know did okay did you know had an interesting practice and then I, i'd always done lots and lots of acting um gotten taken stuff every year all throughout this time to the to the edinburgh festival um carried on doing and um, I decided just for fun to apply to, or just out of interest really, to apply to drama school, two drama schools, to see if I was good enough to get in. Just out of interest really, um, and and I did get in. And I'd seen so many barristers uh, around, over you know, drunk on Friday nights around the Temple in London, always talking about I could have been, I could, I played the guitar, I could have done this, I could have been a, a this, I could have been a that. They all seem to be frustrated other things. Um, and so I decided, well, I've got an opportunity here. Um, let's go and see if I am, you know, good enough. And so that was, you know, I really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed, I had a fascinating time um, as a barrister. Um, 
and uh, and then as a uh, as an actor as well. Um, and I did quite a lot of stuff as an actor. Um, but all that time I was working with history. Um, I was writing plays, historical plays and radio plays and all kinds of things. And that kind of, you know, led to to writing these non-fiction, what led directly into writing these non-fiction books. Um, history was always my real passion. So, yeah, here I am. It's a long, a long, a longer story than it needed to be. Uh, so that's a long journey to get to, I have to say. Mm. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look first of all over three books. Um, yeah. And the first one I want to take you back twelve years to Beauty and Atrocity. Um, and what we're gonna do is we, you've selected uh, six images uh, that we're gonna yeah. be talking. Right. And the idea behind it really is to get to the, the story behind um, each one that you've chosen and look at not just the history, but how you actually used it as part of a source, a rich source or tapestry that helps to explain and uncover your, the, the story of your books. Yeah. Um, so first of all, the one that, that we have uh, before you is the mural on the Shank Hill, um, which is the Red Hand of Ulster. Um, mm. Question is, uh, where is the story behind the mural? Okay, so well, it's very, very interesting. I, I should just say, so this beauty interesting wasn't my first book. So I'd done quite a few oral histories before then, um, and uh, a couple of other things. But this came about when I was confident enough. I'd done, I'd written some books before, and I was confident enough actually to take on a subject like this, which was very different. To anything I'd done before. So I couldn't have done this one at, at the beginning. It needed a certain sort of confidence in knowing what I was doing and knowing what I was looking for. And what I was trying to do, I, like so many other people, had grown up in at the time of the Troubles, where the Troubles were in the newspapers every single day. You know, there was there was something happening that was in the papers, something on the news. It was a kind of, a kind of tit for tat that one side would commit a killing, another the other side would, and it would go backwards and forwards. And and I just, like most people, I think, didn't know why they were doing it. I wanted now to, ha I had this platform that I had you know, opportunity to actually explore. Um, I wanted to go to Northern Ireland and to spend a year, really, in at the South as well, but mainly the North of Ireland, meeting the people who were doing this stuff. The, the, the people who were members of the IRA, the UVF, but also the police, also... Um, uh, ordinary people who were caught up in the troubles and soldiers. Um, I wanted to find out from these people. I wanted to get the story of you know, who these people were, why they hate each other, why were they killing each other? Because in Britain, we never got the story. You know, we, we saw what was happening, but we never, it was never really explained to us. It seemed to me it wasn't. Um, who was doing, who were doing what and why they were doing it. So this was my opportunity to go and meet these people. And at the same time, one thing I very quickly found was that history in Ireland is absolutely part of everyday life. Um, you know, you, you, it's as real, things that happened decades, centuries ago are as real to people living now um, as, as what they had for breakfast. And I found that uh, very much on, on, on both sides of the divide. You know, you'd go on the Shankill, for example, where this mural is, which is a loyalist area, but just so close to the to the Republican areas, um, or to the Falls, which are a Republican area, um, you'd you'd uh, be able to go into a pub called the the, the Rex Bar in Shankill, um, and you know basically it, it's it's covered with murals um, about the, the Battle of the Somme. I mean, on the face of it, what's it got to do with the Battle of the Somme? And yet this pub is basically covered, pasted in memories of the Battle of the Somme um, and, and the 36th Ultra Division, who are the heroes. And, and you know, for the people in this area, the, the Battle of the Somme is still being fought. And then you go to the Shankill and, and the, the Irish rebels of 1916 have just risen. These things are, you know, absolutely um, there in their minds. And this is one of the murals, this Red Hand of Ulster in the Shankill. Um, and it's it's very near the, 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 the that Rex Bar pub. Um, and it's a really interesting mural, this one, because it's one that actually spans the divide. Very few things, well, I say very few things, getting to know people on both sides of the peace wall, the people are basically essentially the same, but there aren't too many icons that actually um, are, are shared between the two sides. And this red hand of Ulster 
is one. And there are various versions of this story because not only is history absolutely alive to people and the past is as relevant as the present, but so is legend. You know, you go even beyond history and there are legends that people swear by, you know, people, and no wonder they do because they, they reflect the state of mind. So this, the Red Hand of Ulster, it's a symbol that you'll see all over the place, mainly in union, you know, in unionist circles, but you also see it on the other side as well. So for example, you know, the Irish Citizens Army, which was very much a Republican uh, organization, had the Red Hand of Ulster on it. The Gaelic Athletic Association, which is, you know, Irish sports, has the Red Hand of Ulster on it. So this has spanned the divide and the story, what you're looking at there, is Strangford Loch, which is this loch on the uh, East Coast. And the story is that I think it's the, the one of the O'Neills, it's one of the stories, the most famous story. The, 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 there's these two chieftains and they're basically having a race in boats on the loch. And the person who reaches the far side first will have um, the crown, will, will, will own Ulster. Uh, and so the one person is ahead and there, what you can see there is O'Neill, um, who's slightly behind, but he has an idea. So what he does is he cuts off his own hand. He's slightly behind in his boat, but he, with the other hand, he hurls his hand onto the shore. It touches the hand first, so he's won the race, and Ulster is his. And I love this story because it's the story of somebody who's willing to mutilate themselves in order to control the province. And my goodness me, when you're there and studying the history of the last few hundred years, you see this again and again and again this uh, this real this symbolic idea of people willing to do anything to basically mutilate themselves to cause untold harm to themselves their own side to to anybody in order to gain control of ulster so it's to me you know when i saw that um that mural amongst all the others um i just thought it was so telling and so so sort of indicative of a frame of mind that you find, you do find um, all across the province. And it's there, you know, next to, as I say, it's nearby the, the Somme pub, where incidentally at the Battle of the Somme, when the 36th Ultra Division went over the top at the Somme, they were shouting, no surrender. And the units to the side were thinking, well, what, why are they shouting surrender when they're just going over the top? And it was because they were shouting about no surrender was the great sh shout at the great call, the great um, um, call at the siege of death. At the time, they were also chanting about the past. The past is always alive um, in, in Northern Ireland. And very near to this is another mural, which was uh, done fairly recently, which was a, a young man with his nickname Top Gun, and he's wearing a baseball cap wrong way around. Um, and it says underneath his date of death, which I forget what it was, it was 2000 or something. And it says, sleeping where no shadows lie, he gave his name. And so I looked him up um, in um, the, the amazing Bible of the Troubles, which talks about every, every death that happened in the Troubles called Lost Lives. And it turns out that he was a man, what he had done was to go into um, uh, a chemist shop and basically shoot um, the woman behind the counter and, and carry on firing at her while she's lying on the ground. But he is now a hero and supposedly sleeping where no shadows lie. Um, so it's an incredibly, you know, you, you look at these murals and hopefully they are now symbols of history, you know, some things that will, you know, have a sort of strange heritage value. But until very recently, they weren't, you know, they were alive. Um, and just in the same way that they were alive. So all of this history is constantly alive in Northern Ireland. So that's and why. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and Josh, you, we were mentioning just before we came on air, um, you were thinking about maybe uh, a, a, a next chapter to this book, if you ever had a chance to go back to it. What do you think that would look like now? What, what would you well, I would, love to, I would love to reissue this book. I mean, it's so, it's so relevant. I mean, you know, the Northern Ireland keeps coming back into... Um, you know, our consciousness, partly because it's a problem that's never fully gone away. You know, the peace has, has, has never been, you know, fully, um, fully sorted. Um, uh, partly because, you know, Brexit has, again has brought it so much to the fore. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the idea 
of you know United Kingdom, um, uh, you know what constitutes the United Kingdom and 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 the idea of the border in the in in the North Sea and and the United the EU um, to the south in Ireland. So what I would do is quite simply go back and continue my journey. That's what was so, what was so fantastic about this being able to write this book was to be able to go and meet these people, some of whom, or you know, I, I could tell, because the past is still alive, I could go and tell the story of the past by meeting people in the present. So I was able to meet, you know, a man called John Beresford Ash, who's, uh, you know, he, he, he was able to tell me about the recent past, but he was also, you know, two of his ancestors, one of them fought in the, was present in the siege of Derry, um, another was one of the original settlers who came over um, from London. To, you know, one of the reasons why there's this large contingent of Protestants in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, one was his uh, direct ancestor. So, again, I would go back and I would basically bring the story up to date. I would do another chapter to to bring us up to where where we are today. Um, and. I would just love the opportunity to do that. And I, I think one thing I would particularly do is deal, in, in this book, I dealt with two very different parallel groups. One was a group um, of young people from both sides of the divide who had been very badly affected by the troubles. And, you know, they were enormous. It's a very small place, Northern Ireland. It's, you know, half the size of, of Wales. And yet, you know, enormous percentage of, of people in Northern Ireland have been personally affected by the troubles in some way. And this group called WAVE, amazing group, people who uh, dealt with young people who had been affected, whose parents had been killed, who, who, who in some way had been personally affected. And I met a lot of young people and I got their sense of, you know, where they were um, in, in, in the sense of, you know, many of them had never had any closure. They hadn't, because, so much had gone unsaid um, after the Good Friday Agreement. The, the things, that, a lid had been put on things, but nobody or very few people had found out what had really happened to their relatives who'd been killed. The stories weren't investigated. So a lot of people didn't get closure and a lot of these young people hadn't had any closure. So I would like to go back and talk to them again to ask whether in the sort of however many years it's been, eight or nine years, whether they've received closure, whether they know very, any more about who it was that killed their father, whether there's any more sort of light being shone on the past in Northern Ireland, or whether out of expediency, the lid has just been being um, And at the same time, I met those people, young people, and I also went and met some people in, two young men in Derry who were very much on the edges of the real IRA, which was um, uh, an organization at the time. And they were very much of the view that the, the Martin McGuinnesses, the Jerry Adams, these people who then, you know, came to the peace table, they had had their time in the sun. They had, they had been freedom fighters who had made that area uh, an area fighting for, um, for its freedom. That's how they saw it. They had then basically ended the troubles or, you know, brought, 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 brought the people to the um, peace table and these young people saw themselves as being left in the lurch. They said that the, the problems hadn't been solved. The British were still in Ireland. Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom. Uh, Northern Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom. Nothing had changed. But they were being told to keep quiet, to pipe down, and to, and to live quiet lives. And they were saying, now there's no pride in this area. This area, which was fighting for its freedom, they said, was now just another um, you know, deprived area with the same problems as everywhere, everywhere else. And they wanted the chance to fight. So I'd like to go back and find them and see where they are with it now. One thing that comes through loud and clear is that, that, that finding so many stories from individuals that you meet, um, I think just, just really fascinating. Um, we have to move on. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, our second image uh, ah. for, you, for you is uh, one that I, I, I've titled here, the, uh, this one uh, was the Peace Wall. Yeah. Um, this is something that you found, I gather. Did you yep. meet the family? I um, didn't. I, I should have. I should have knocked on the door. But in, in a way, um, I, 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 I wanted just to, 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 to view it. It was something I saw as I was passing. I actually had to sort of jump up and poke the camera over a wall. Um, 
And I just found it the most moving. So that's the peace wall, this, right. this euphemistic wall that divides the city. And as I say, these people on either side, you know, whether they're um, loyalist, unionist, Republican, um, th when you go either side, you find that there's not really much difference between them. But the only place they ever meet is on holiday. You know, if they come to New York or somewhere, they meet there and they're able to talk, they come back and they can't meet. Um, and that's still the same, something like 8% of the children in Northern Ireland go to uh, integrated schools. So they don't meet the other the other side. And there's, you get lots of terrible stories of, you know, relationships starting between young people and then they're warned off, they're not allowed to keep it going. Um, and I found this on what, this is a garden, that's someone's garden. And there's a little trampoline just wedged in between their, you know, their window, I don't know what you'd call that, it's covered in, um, uh, in, in a grate because things are thrown over the peace walls and and they, you know, they'll get a Molotov cocktail through the through, through the through the front room, through the back room. But I found that so moving that they're trying to have somehow an ordinary life. There's a kid bouncing up and down on that trampoline some of the time, uh, even though there's barbed wire and corrugated iron above them. And I found that to be just incredibly moving. I only found it by you know really peering over the top, and as I say, sort of holding my camera over my head. And I just found that to be, um just such a symbolic little photo uh, and, and it made me so sad and it made me really want to explore more and to find out you know how how people could be more integrated they don't get to meet each other for for, for the most part things are changing but very slowly did you find this at the beginning of uh, at the beginning of your research the end did you come across it halfway through did it have I think that i think i came across about halfway through um and it made me more keen to meet people from both sides, you know, really from both sides, whether they were the people who wanted to meet up with each other or the more entrenched who didn't. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the, I, I remember going on a, on a, uh, a kind of bus tour right at, my, at the very beginning. Um, and they, they said as part of the bus tour, they, they showed the hospital and they announced this is a hospital that treats equally um, Catholics and Protestants. And I remember thinking, my God, they're making, it's, it's actually making a big deal of the fact that the, the hospital treats Catholics and Protestants. And when, I remember when I was, when I was um, putting a caption on this, I, I, I wrote that this, you know, this was in a, uh, a, a Catholic back garden. And I suddenly thought, my God, I'm giving, I'm giving a garden a, a religion. I mean, it, you know, it all becomes so ridiculous. And then you start to think of, you know what, what makes what what are the identities i mean is are the troubles about religion are they about being catholic and being protestant of course they're not they're not you know that those are the labels initially protestants were brought to settle a catholic country but the people who've been fighting this the, the, the troubles they're not religious people you know it's all about and it's not really about culture as i saw their culture is pretty much the same it's about identity it's about what we are and what they are it's it's more about what we are not, um, and so it's all—it's kind of a negative. You know what, what? What people are declaiming is a negative. I am not what he is, even though they don't really necessarily know what he is and don't realize he's actually quite like you. So, as as a person able to go both sides of this wall, I saw it as my duty in writing this book to show that these people actually were quite similar. Carol, throughout tonight, hopefully we've got um, a few people uh, adding questions in. Um, thank you, Josh. Um, so far, absolutely fascinating. Um, Carol, have we had anything so far? Um, the first key question that's come up is whether you think a resolution is likely to happen within our lifetime, based on the fact that I remember teaching this as a topic 20 years ago, and we were talking then about the next generation, who are, of course, the young adults now. I suppose it depends what you mean by a resolution. Um, you know, the, the trouble is, for example, if you if there's a united Ireland, uh, which a lot of people want, and, and I, it, it seems to me that it, you know, the, the, when when the surveys tend to go along with the economics, you know, if 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 the South is doing well, then more people are in favour of a united Ireland. If if Britain is doing well, then more people are in favour, and that's good. I mean, it, you know, if if people can start to see it more in economic terms, then it means they're less rigidly, um, you know, wedded to to, to their own sectarian 
to their previous sectarian beliefs. So that, that probably is a positive. But if you kind of reverse the situation, you'll have, if you have a United Ireland, then you'll have a, a UVF, a UDA. You'll have the, the loyalists who may well then become the, the terrorists within the new, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of freedom fighters, stroke terrorists within um, the, the, the new setup. So I'm not entirely sure what a resolution would be. I think they've been incredibly, I mean, you know, in the book, I go into lots of the reasons I think behind the piece. And it, it includes people being very, very pragmatic. It means, you know, I, I think a, a lot of it's to do with um, America after 9-11 uh, suddenly, um, you know, waking up to, to the fact that, that um, well, I mean, I think Northern Ireland had a great self-importance. It, you know, it, it, it's, it, it was sort of known, the troubles were known, sort of, and, and, and sort of venerated in America um, to, to some degree. And after 9-11, I think that died down a bit. And some of the self-importance went out of Northern Ireland. They, people started to see it as, a, a, as quite a grubby fight in a way that it didn't, you know, a lot of the glory of it sort of dissipated uh, in America, certainly. And I think that was a push towards things. And then I think huge pragmatism on the part of people like Jerry Adams, people like um, Ian Paisley, you know, who, who, who you know, uh, Ian Paisley managed to change his views overnight. I will never sit down with the IRA. Within weeks, he was sitting down with the IRA. Jerry Adams' whole idea of armor light in one hand, ballot box in the other. Um, uh, it, it's very, it's a very complicated question. Um, but the, the, but the fact that you know there is a form of peace there now means I suspect that over a long period of time, whether it's in my lifetime, I don't know, but over a long period of time, you know, the, the, the antagonism will ultimately wither. But I think in order for that to happen, I do think that there has to be more than 8% of children in integrated schools. You know, you've got to work at the grassroots. But somebody I spoke to said, you know, they knew that things were changing in Northern Ireland when they noticed, you know, a long time ago, that restaurants were opening up and cafes were opening up and you, you thought people, young people were going out more. And they said this wasn't necessarily yet reflected in the talk of the politicians, but they saw that something was happening from beneath. And I think that when that really takes hold, where people are really, you know, um, when, 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 it, when it's more important to be young than it is to be sectarian, then things really will change. Um, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, we've yeah. got it's, uh, I know, yeah. Yeah. I'm now, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, thanks, Steph. Uh, this is um, from your second book. If you'd like to just give us a little bit of background to it, that would be great, Josh, uh, to the book itself. Well, The Secret History of the Blitz. Yeah, I, again, I love this book. <laughs> it's very modest, isn't it? And I, I, what I should say is I loved writing this book. Um, and it's because in the way that Northern Ireland was, you know, exciting adventure and, and, and journey, um, this was, in, in another way, it was a journey. It was trying to go behind the um, stereotype, behind the cliches of a period of time. And it's not really a book about the bombing. I talk about the bombing. But what I'm really talking about is the social changes that were taking place in Britain and how in some ways uh, it was the kind of, a lot of the seeds were planted for modern Britain during this time. Um, and I was trying, what I'm trying, what I was trying to do was to find stories that just hadn't been told before. And I got really lucky with this particular story. Um, this is the story of American oil drillers um, working in Sherwood Forest. So uh, basically um, Britain was obviously, you know, during, during the war, Oil was incredibly important. Um, you know, the country could only keep going um, uh, militarily and uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with oil. And the oil was coming in from, the vast majority of it was coming in from America, coming in on tankers, um, some from the Middle East, but not so much. Um, and those obviously were prey to, to U-boats and also to, to, to bombing in the ports. Um, and a lot of it was being lost. And Britain, in the same way that the people were being told to make do and mend, the country, you know, the land itself had to make do and mend. And the way it was doing it in terms of oil, they basically sent people out to try and find oil in Britain. This was long before North Sea oil. And they found in Sherwood Forest, 
deposits of really high grade oil. And no one knows about this. And they started to drill for it. Um, and they found it was really high quality. It was good enough for the, for the high performance Spitfires and Hurricanes of the Battle of Britain. The problem was they couldn't get it out of the ground properly. They didn't have um, the, the, the material. They didn't, you know, they didn't have the, 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 the oil wells. They didn't have the manpower to do it. Um, so they turned, as is so often the case, they turned to America. Uh, and so what these, they basically, these are American drillers. These people you see here in this picture are American drillers. They brought in, I was somewhere between 40 and 50 Americans, basically. So not so well, they had to, not just the drillers, but the equipment as well. So they had, you know, they just had a few sort of out of date old wells that they'd been using in the Middle East, drilling equipment that they had here. Um, and so they had to get stuff, all the, all, the, all the drilling equipment and the men to drill it from America. So what they did was they, they, they sent somebody over, they found out that there was a bit of a problem here. They couldn't, America wasn't allowed by law to sell it to British people. So they had to set up this sort of old complicated thing where it was sold to an American company who then started drilling in Sherwood Forest. But they did it and they sent over these, um, they're called roughnecks. That's what oil drillers were called. So they basically were, they, they got enormous wages compared to what was common at the time. You know, they got, I can't remember what it was, but you know, 10 times more than they'd have got in the army. Uh, so they all said yes. They were brought over uh, to this country and they were they were wearing jeans, they were wearing leather jackets. People of Nottinghamshire had never seen anything like this in their life, only on screen. Um, and they were, uh, you know, they had guitars with them. They, I mean, they were like uh, unbelievable. It was like where they dropped from the sky. And th so the story went round that they were, must be there to make a film because what else could they possibly be doing um, in wartime Nottinghamshire? Uh, and they they settled into, I mean, couldn't make this up. I mean, you really couldn't. They were, they were put up in a monastery. Um, and the monks initially were very worried that these oil drillers were going to be loud and they were going to be, you know, partying. Although they had, they worked seven days a week, 12 hour shifts on and off. So they didn't really have much time to do any, <laughs> too much other than drill oil. They were exhausted most of the time. And they got on very well with the monks. And the monks had a snooker table. They learned snooker and they got on with the monks. The one thing that they couldn't put up with, they just couldn't abide, really interesting, is the food. Because they couldn't, not only were they not used to British food, they were used to steaks and, you know, they were used to big American meals even then. Um, uh, and the British didn't eat that at the best of times. But what they, but during wartime, and they, they said they couldn't, they, they, so they threatened to go on strike unless we get proper food. Because what they were getting, it really came to, a, came to a head when they were given, for breakfast one morning, they were given the warmed up Brussels sprouts from dinner the night before. And they said, that's it, that's it, they, we're, not, we're not doing this. And so they managed to go to the American, American now entered the war and they went to London and they basically petitioned the the, um, uh, the authorities, the military authorities in London, to say that we need we need some food, proper food sent up, sent to these men, and and they got it, um, and then they carried on, and so they did amazing. They had a few British working with them. They didn't particularly get like the British. They said that the British were too much too um, conservative in the way they were drilling oil. They didn't, you know, they weren't risk taking. They weren't. They, they were weren't using the equipment properly. It's really interesting. You see all of the old sort of divides between the British and the Americans coming out in, My in this. Yeah. Did you say, I said, I lost you. Did you say microcosm? Yeah, microcosm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did a bit of lip reading there. Yeah, I thought what you said. Yeah, it came out in microcosm um, and, and it really did. And even, you've got, I saw the, the one, one of the guys, Americans gave an interview, which I found um, years later. And he, he, he talked about the terrible teeth on the British. Even then, they were complaining about our teeth. Not only you only see this on bad sitcoms, but here an oil driller in 1942 was complaining about our teeth. So it, all, all the old tropes are, are there. But it was, they, they were John, here for, yeah. One of the things I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you was, where do you find these sources? I've never heard anything like this before. And it's Carol's mm -hmm. question. I was I really... How do you just kind of how 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 do you go about the process of finding sources like this? Okay, so so generally, 
it's a case of you know you 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 look for sources you look for stuff everywhere whether it's you know in archives or books that nobody's looked at for a hundred years whatever it is you know or i go to the national archive and archive in america like whatever wherever i can get um and then you find a little something that sends you elsewhere it's kind of a you know it's a it's a sort of um a, a, a very safe detective process it's yeah you know, and it's really fun um it's why you know the, w w the way we have at the moment with all the the archives opening but you can't order things up on the day very frustrating you know the whole process is is kind of inhibited at the moment but um but with this it was slightly different i got really lucky with this i i did you know to make some money um a while before i'd done a private um bit of private research for someone woman who had wanted me to, to to research her husband. She was much younger. Um, he'd been a pilot in the First World War with the Royal Naval Air Service. And then in the Second World War, I discovered he had been an oil inspector with the petroleum board here. And I was looking through his papers and there it all was. And, uh, you know, the, the British oil industry of the Second World War. Like, what? And um, And so that was the... The hint, and then I was able to sort of see. Okay, this is where it was. Uh, so I was able, and and believe it or not, there's a museum there. I mean, it's it's right in the middle of Sherwood Forest. It's minute. It's run by this wonderful man. Well, he's now he's alive, but he's he's well over ninety. Um, uh, he was a you know young man boy really when this was going on. Um, and there are records. I found that interview I told you about was in the British Library. So you you can. You can find, there's always a way, well, not always, sometimes you really do find a, a full stop, but very often there's, there is a way. And I was able to find this story. And like I was saying before, you know, so this was a great story for that book, but actually I'm writing now about, I'm taking the story on to North Africa in the Second World War and the start of the special relationship, the British and the Americans working together practically for the first time, not always very successfully. And this is absolutely, relevant because while they were working militarily together in north africa and in britain you know huge swathes of american troops were coming over canadians before them then the americans so you had enormous numbers of americans men in britain you also had these civilians coming over and telling you so much about the the relationship that was um and and uh, in fact one of these men um, was killed, died in an accident. It was very dangerous. And one of them died, fell off um, uh, the, the, the large derrick. And um, he's the only American civilian buried in the American military cemetery um, here in Britain. So, you know, you find these sort of, you know, Please. gaps. And, and, and I, mean, I think this is such an interesting story. I'd love to take this to to the american ambassador here because I, I suspect they don't know about it they don't know this and, and it's really interesting and it's important so yeah okay uh thank you steph our next image um and uh, just a little bit of explanation uh this is uh rachel dobkin i think i pronounced her name correctly mm -hmm. um, and um this is oh, this was um a feature of, of the book uh where you looked at crime um, I did. during and um a little bit a little bit of background obviously is a, a, a bit of a, 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 a certainly in terms of an image it certainly conveys um something that's gone terribly wrong here yeah. but yeah what helped you to um sort of, sort of discover this story um and take it further well another element of this book i wanted to just write about crime in the blitz because crime there was a huge amount of crime during well during the war during the blitz reason being mainly well two things really one was opportunity um the opportunity was there with with the blackout uh, fewer police on the streets um and and um bombed out houses and black market all the all these th all these things arose out of the great opportunity for crime and there was greater crime also um you know lots of new regulations came in turning people who never committed crime into criminals overnight, strict liability crimes. So people suddenly were in trouble for all kinds of food offences, for having a radio in their car, for having a light coloured car, for owning a peregrine, for having uh, owning a peregrine fork. And I mean, you name it, things became 
crimes overnight and people, um, you know, showing a light is the most obvious one. Um, and these are wartime regulations. Um, and But then in, also the fact is that the, the temperature of the country went up, really. Um, you know, the, in, in the same way that I think Bit Spirit was in essence real, um, organically real, in that people were brought together by the danger. They had something in common. They could empathize with each other for a period of time in a way they hadn't before. And they really were um, brought together. Well, I found a fabulous story about a woman on a bus, uh, a young woman, I met her, and she said she was traveling on a bus, heard a bomb coming down. Um, as the bomb was coming down, uh, the man, there was only one other man on the top of the bus, he got up and walked and they sat together hand in hand. When the bomb exploded elsewhere, he got back up and walked up to the top of the bus. Um, they never exchanged a word. That is instinctive blitz, blitz spirit. They were literally brought together by the bombing. Um, and that did happen. But in the same way, because this intensity of the period it brought people together. It also encouraged people to behave in ways they never had before. And crime was one of those. People took risks they never had before. And it, in looking at crime, it occurred to me, well, wasn't the Blitz, wouldn't there be a great time to, to basically kill someone, dispose of their body and blame it on the bombing? I mean, how many times must that have happened? But the only one I could find was this, Rachel Dobkin. Um, this was a very unhappy marriage. Um, uh, her husband had, had basically, they'd been apart together, apart, together, apart. He hadn't paid maintenance. Um, and and um, the, she basically was had disappeared. And then a body was found about uh, a year later. And uh, she was through found through very, very early use of dental records. And also this put mapping a photo of her face on top of the skull. And you can see there. You know, it it, it, it it correlates beautifully. No, beautifully is not that's the right word. Um, and and so that they identified her through these various new methods. Um, and it was found that her husband um, had actually been a fire watcher uh, on the bomb site where she was found. Uh, and they looked into it. They found they'd had this terrible relationship. He was brought in. He basically had deposited her body. Um, but instead of just putting it on the bomb site, he put a slab over it. A bomb couldn't have put this slab over her body. He'd taken too much, too many pains to stop her from being discovered. So a bomb couldn't have done it. He had done it. Um, and he was found um, guilty of her murder at the Old Bailey, uh, and he was executed. And I found this story just absolutely fascinating because it just seemed to me it must not have been the only one. It, there must have been other scores settled, other people who were victims of grudges, victims of disappeared during the blitz and were basically got rid of and, and never found, partly because there was so much chaos, uh, uh, but pe presumably their bodies were deposited in, in bomb sites and, and they hadn't been as foolish as, as, as Dobkin. So I, I just found this to be uh, you know, in some ways, the archetypal crime of the Blitz. Um, um, yeah. Carol, just very quickly, going back to the chat, has there been any questions that have been raised? Sorry, I had to do the unmuting. Um, at no. the minute, we've covered, to be honest, the things that are coming through, we've covered most of them. Although when we're talking about crime, um, there does seem to be this real change in attitude to what is acceptable during the war, especially with things like looting. How did you come across that? Because it's kind of against the whole blitz spirit thing. It is very much against the whole blitz spirit, but it's also if you look at if you look at um, looting, I mean, there's very there's a very narrow gap, fine line between looting and recycling. Actually, I mean, you know, there, there were very very strict laws against looting, and you you know, in theory, you could be <laughs> executed for, for looting. I mean, you know, it was it was, it was really it was a, it was a big deal, um, but but the. Uh, but but in fact, you know, if you were if somebody was bombed out, I mean, there's lots of examples of this. Someone's bombed out, and you're you happen to know that they're they're not around, or they've been killed, or whatever it is, and you happen to find something in the wreckage, and you think I could use that, or someone else could use that, you take it. I mean, you're guilty of looting, but nowadays you'd be you know congratulated on you know making and and you know the country's been told to make do and mend and you you know reuse in all sorts of different ways, so. So absolutely, I mean, it, it, 
looting was very much against the spirit of, you know, um, of the Blitz. But it was very, very common. Of course it was, because people are people. And the, the point I was trying to make endlessly throughout this book was that actually they, they don't really work against each other. You know, the, because, as I say, the intensity of the period was so great and people were kind of behaving in all kinds of new ways. That meant finding connections with each other, you know, volunteering on a massive scale. People were desperate to volunteer in different ways um, to help with the war effort, but it doesn't mean they weren't also out for themselves in lots of the same people. I, I mean, the, be the best story I found about this was, was a career criminal. Um, uh, he had a gang of four people. They used to, what they used to do was they, they, they'd steal a van, they'd take it out in a, in a raid, uh, and they take it to somewhere that had a safe, and they basically there'd be nobody about. They'd manhandle four of them, would manhandle a safe into their van, um, and they drive it away in this raid in order to open it at their leisure. So they did that one day. They parked up during a raid at um, London Bridge, went into this warehouse. They knew they'd staked it out before. Knew had a safe. We we'll bring the safe out when a bomb dropped nearby. Threw them all up into the air. Threw the safe up into the air. They then ran, they, you know, that's enough of that, we'll leave it. They started to run. And one of them, whose name brilliantly, not real name, was Spider, because he was a kind of cat burglar, saw a child in a, a, a window, like a third floor window that they were running past, shimmied up the drain pipe, whatever it was, to get up to the window, had the child in his arms, was going to bring the child down. When a fire engine came along with a policeman in it, because policemen were supposed to arrive at any incident, uh, and sent the ladder up, and they brought Spider and the child down. The policeman said, you have saved this child's life. We'd like to, you know, recommend you for some kind of award. Spider, who knew that the safe was still just over there, and wanted no, didn't want his name taken, didn't want anything, just wanted to get away. Um, but what that story indicates is that this was a time of great intensity, of great, where, you know, you could go from, from, thieving to saving a life in the, in the flash of a bomb. And, and it was an extraordinary period. Um, uh, and, and that's what I was trying to, to get across. And all these stories, including one that's coming up, sort of indicate that this was a very, it was an unusual period that I'm not sure has always got its due, I suppose. Thank you, Josh. Um, fascinating. Uh, social, and it really is, you're focusing very much on the social history of the Blitz here, aren't you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely the theme that runs through the book um it's a theme thanks. That runs most of them actually yeah uh, yeah uh, thanks steph um we're going to move on to the next image um and this is this is yeah. um uh and uh first of all well, well you gave me a little bit of a background to this because i i you know i i had to to really think about the questions for for well for the entirety of today but um why do you think one of the things that you mentioned was this is rarely discussed um, as a theme? And why do you think that is the case? I'm so sorry, Annie. I lost you there. I have to say it again. I'm really sorry. Um, I, this was really, you, you considered this as the first sexual revolution. Oh, yeah. I think that's to quote you. Why do you think this is very rarely discussed? Oh, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, I think it was, it was very much a sort of reaction to events rather than the movement. So, you know, the 60s, we know, that was, a, that was you know, tune in, drop out. It was all the sort of sexual um, freedoms. This was uh, surreptitious. It was a reaction to events. It wasn't a movement. Um, so it wasn't something people were necessarily boasting. It was happening, but it wasn't something that people were necessarily open about or boasting about or talking about afterwards. I think also a lid was put on it afterwards by people who were very quickly modifying their behavior after the war. So there was a thing called, a sort of thing called wartime marriage, which is basically people who um, were brought together during the war who weren't together. You know, a woman might have a, a, a husband who was a soldier in the Middle East. Um, a, 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 um, and you get this couple. So I, in fact, I found a woman who was very much like this. She, her husband was away fighting and she started having a, a relationship with a man from a, one of the ministries who was down from Scotland. So everyone was married, but they were now effectively together and they lived together as a married couple, but always on the understanding that when this is over, we go back to our partners, our original husbands and wives. This was, you know, 
it's it's it, it's a wartime marriage is what it was called marriage of convenience and so you know i, I remember thinking it was sort of the, the sexual equivalent of powdered egg you know it's for the duration um so it wasn't meant to uh, a lid was always put on it or normally put on it afterwards people um modified their behavior um and and i think i think the, also the authorities really did the best that they could to to end it um you know you've got the archbishop of canterbury after the, just after the war urging britons to get away from immorality and and sexual indulgence you have the marriage guidance council becoming very important and popular promoting a return to chastity you've got um the media focusing on traditional feminine roles you know feminine dress so i, I mean i think I, you know the 60s was a reaction to the 50s but I think the 50s, where things really toughened up, were a reaction to this. So in the 50s, you had, you know, normal, huge numbers of rules about homosexuality, for example. You know, that became um, the, the number of successful prosecutions for, for homosexuality were something like five times as many after the war than before the war. You know, the authorities were really trying to clamp down on anything that they saw as immoral or, or damaging to the family. Or, um, Did you did you find Josh in the sources? Did you find you know personal you know experiences like this or recollections of of, of the sort of crackdown after after the end of the, of the Second World War? Actually, to be perfectly honest, I didn't look so much at the crackdown after the war. I think that that was a whole other. I mean, something I would love to do, but I Did think it's a whole. Other, I, I was focusing more on 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 the war. Um, to a, to a degree, I mean, I did you know I did look after the war, and and there were, you know, I did see. Um, you know, there were, there were all sorts of things that were happening and, um, you know, people trying to clamp down, trying to sort of, you know, put a lid on, on behavior. Uh, and, and some of those were, for example, like the Marriage Guidance Council and like the, you know, the, the incredibly harsh laws on homosexuality. Um, but for, for the most part, these were reactions to the fact that things had become more liberal during wartime. And of course they had, you know, people, people were, as I say, taking... You know, in terms of sex, well, let's go into London life. For goodness sake, there it is, sitting there. This is a mag. This is a fetish magazine um, from the Second World War, and there they are. These are the girls of the Windmill Theatre, the, you know, the famous "We Never Close" Windmill Theatre, and there they are on a cover of a, a magazine you could get in any newsagent. Um, you know, wearing the the COVID masks of their day, um, and so uh, you know, the London life was fascinating. You could get it freely. It was a fetish magazine. It was, it was kind of a cross between. Reader's Digest, because it had, you know, ordinary articles in it about, you know, kings and queens and stuff like that. But then a lot of it I got, you know, was about weird sort of fetishy stuff. I say weird, you know, whatever, maybe to some not very weird. But it was, you know, I'll just read here very quickly. Um, this, it had letters from people, some of which were real and some were made up. But here's someone called Long Hair Lover, uh, was woken up to find my son thrilled beyond words i became aware that one of my aunts was waving her unbound hair over my face i next became conscious of a most exquisite sensation about my feet my other aunt had uncovered my tootsies and was busily engaged in waving her head of hair over my bare feet they had awakened me with the tickle of their hair a thrilling experience now reading that now you'd think oh god that's supposed to be funny isn't it 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 wasn't this was something that to the majority of people, they would have read it and thought, what on earth are they talking about? Why is his aunt tickling his feet with a, and to those who, to, 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 to someone who didn't know, it was meaningless. It was just, it was, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. To someone who did know, they knew. And it was full of stuff like this, stuff about rubber and leather and all kind, whatever your fetish was, it was all here. And to those who knew, they knew. And they got it. And to those who didn't, it was something that could never be explained. And um, and and, and it, the fact that this became so popular, and this magazine, and so many people were writing in. There, there, there's one brilliant story in it about an air raid shelter. Someone writes in my shelter. We now all read London Life, and we all sit there. We, we even even once the bombing has stopped, we stay there because we can't stop reading London Life. Uh, and they and one man who had been in France in the First World War talks about the French clubs you know that he visited in the first world war anyway, the point is that this kind of thing was suddenly possible available and more popular because people were doing things people might be dead tomorrow and they were taking chances and they were living lives 
you know, so much more homosexuality. I mean, you know, if you if you read, there have been wonderful accounts of how, you know, what Quentin Crisp talks about, how London became a double bed during the Blitz. Um, and and the fact was the opportunity was there. The police weren't interested. They had better things to do than to focus in on this kind of stuff. So they were looking the other way. There were so many more people around. If you look at London, you know, you had all these soldiers from America, from from um, uh, the Dominions, from the Commonwealth, from occupied Europe. You had people flooding in from all over the people with different attitudes, but un experiencing the same dangers. and. And there was a kind of opening of minds, and London think, life reflects that. I think your story about the London bus, about the bombing, and, and the gentleman that comes down, down to actually sit with it, it just it just exemplifies some of the things yeah. that were happening at that time. Yeah. Um, thank you, Josh. Um, Carol, have you had any questions at all? I pretty much covered all the ones I was going to um, ask about the, the change in attitudes to, to sexuality, but you've covered that already. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, Josh, I'm, I'm aware that we've, we've covered two books yeah. now. OK, and uh, in two, two images, we're now going to move on to your third choice of book, uh, which is uh, your Dunkirk, uh, the history behind the motion um, picture. Um, and you've chosen uh, one image side by side. Um, if we can uh, now go on to, thank you, Steph, to um, our, our old final image. Um, but today what I wanted to do, I know I know there's a lot to unpick here. Um, and um, in fact, this was the, of the ones I, um, I sent to you. This is the one I, was, I found uh, in your book most fascinating. Um, could you let, let me a little bit into exactly why you chose it yeah. uh, and, and what challenges you faced on set? I, I chose this because it's a really good example of how the film and the original event kind of worked together um, and potentially against each other. Um, you have on the left, you have the original photo taken by... Um, uh, a naval officer, um, and what you see there, so that clearly is the, the beaches of Dunkirk, I think that's Bray Dunes, and you have um, the, the deck of a ship, you've got soldiers who are on the ship who are looking out at others who are queuing to get on this ship. But what you can't see in that photo is that they're not standing on the sand, they're standing on uh, a pier made out of lorries. And the lorries, basically what the Royal Engineers, who were very resourceful, um, you, you had, obviously, you had the British Army congregating within uh, the Dunkirk perimeter. And what, one thing the Royal Engineers, you had all these, they, basically the British Army were going to be leaving all of their material and, and virtually all of their weapons, everything they had virtually in Dunkirk. All the lorries around, lorry ambulances, you know, um, motor vehicles. And what they did was to basically push them out to sea, to tether them together, and to put boards over the top. So these men are standing on those tethered motor vehicles. Right. And that way they're able to, you know, it's a makeshift jetty. Um, and that was carried out by the Royal Engineers. They did it at one spot, it worked, they did it everywhere else. Everywhere else, they did it elsewhere. What you see on the right is that being carried out for the film. So you, you've got the basically production assistant who's who's sort of in charge of, of um, you know, trying to, you know, they're filming it, but they're also doing it. Um, and it's what one really interesting thing that I found of, of art mirroring life is that they found when they were doing it on the in the film that they had to burst the tires. Otherwise, the lorries would start to float away. And they found exactly the same thing in real life. And, and, um, and so, you know, that's, I suppose, an indication that they were doing it properly, or at least they were trying to do it properly. And so, but it's just interesting to see those two, you know, what you've got on the right, basically, are lots of extras, um, supporting artists, one should say, from um, their local people, local kids from, from Dunkirk, um, because the director, Christopher Nolan, didn't like to use CGI. So, Basically, there was very, there was no, there weren't any troops, soldiers CGI'd. 
They were all real, either real people or cardboard cutouts. Amazing, he used the technology of 1920. Um, and um, and then on the on the left is the real thing, one of those fantastic photos that you know somebody happened to have a camera um, and 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 got a, a photo of it actually happening. And it, it it's interesting because there are a few examples that I found whilst doing this or whilst working on the film that I found one really inter I think interesting. Um, I found an account in the National Archives from um, uh, a communications officer that said they brought basic. So, so you had a man called William Tennant, who was the naval officer, senior naval officer ashore. And he was brought out to Dunkirk and he had great difficulty in communicating either with the ships offshore or, um, or with uh, Dover. And what he ended up doing, trying to do, was to use the French um, wireless sets, which were the, the French headquarters in Dunkirk. So they brought him out a Marconi wireless transmitter. And I found the, the account, so this was brought out, and it was going for a few hours, and then it broke down because of sand in the generator. And I, I remember reading this and thinking, God, how did they let that happen? I mean, you know, this thing is so valuable in terms of yeah, it's needed so much. And I had this sort of picture, genuinely. I did. I couldn't work it out. I had this picture of a couple of sort of Laurel and Hardy naval ratings, sort of dropping it in the sand and just sort of pretending that you know it wasn't there for. And then when we went out and spent a lot of time out there, I had been there before, but not spent you know really good period of time. And this was the same time of year, end of May, beginning of June. Found that the sand would. You know, the wind would whip up the sand. You get these real sandstorms, um, incredibly surprising sandstorms. Where everyone suddenly, all these film people would have be wearing goggles and, and sort of scarves, and and you suddenly realise, God, that's what happened. You know, that's how this was a proper sandstorm that would have clogged up the generator. You know, they didn't drop it. Lauren Hardy didn't drop it in sand. And it's that thing, you know, that thing you, you know, where sometimes the you know, to get a real sense of history, that you know, the, the you know, the, the the place, the time and place, the location, because it informs your um your your knowledge. That's exactly what it was. I mean, I don't think you could have known that. Well, you might have been able to guess, but I couldn't. Um, you, if you weren't there, you could only know that for being there at the time and spending yeah. that much time yeah. with it. And that that well, was a very very moving, actually. Yeah. That that's. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, that brings to a close our, our, uh, our history uh, behind. Thank you very much, Josh, for your time tonight. Um, you. So to say a big thank you also uh, for your Q&A um, on Dunkirk that you did with Tom Rogers. Um, this week. It's very much appreciated. If you have a chance, it's on our, our platform um, on YouTube. So please check that out. Um, but it leaves me to say on behalf of the team, uh, thank you very much for sharing with us your images tonight and lending us across three books, um, your experiences and your insight. Thank you.